Welcome everybody. We're um, we're just going to um, wait a few seconds for um, people to join us. Um, um, thank you for supporting the Urban Tree Festival and for attending this uh, this webinar on urban trees and climate change. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers for you this afternoon. Um, I'm Neil Sindon, um, director of CPRE London, and we've been organising the um, Tree Rings webinar series as part of the Urban Tree Festival. Um, and we've had a fantastic um, series of uh, sessions uh, up till now, and we've got a few more coming coming up um, up to the weekend, which we can say a bit more about later. Um, we are now at, um, I think we've got 20 plus attendees. We're going to give it a few more minutes, and then I'm going to hand over to um, Ruth Knight from the Greater London Authority, who will be chairing uh, this session. Um, so if you can bear with us a moment or two. I should say that um, uh, if you haven't, um, uh, we're great. it's great to see you here. If you've managed to donate to the Urban Tree Festival, which is largely volunteer run, then thank you very much indeed. If you haven't donated already and you're, or you'd like to make a further donation after this session, please, please do so. I'll be um, pasting relevant links and information into the chat panel as we go through uh, the webinar um, this afternoon. And um, we'll also be obviously using the Q&A panel, so I'm sure you're now familiar with all this. So please paste any questions you have in the Q&A panel for the presenters. I think we're sort of stabilising at um, around 30 or so participants. Um, so I think, Ruth, I'm going to hand over to you and um, take it away. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, so, as Neil said, I'm Ruth Knight from the Great London Authority and the Environment Team, and thank you for joining today. We've got three great speakers lined up for you, so I'm not going to speak in, in any depth at the beginning here. First, we're going to have Mary, Professor Mary Gagan from Swansea University, uh, who's appeared nicely on the screen. Um, then we'll move through to Kristen Gilder, my, my colleague at the GLA, and finally on to Professor Matt Disney from UCL. Um, and as Neil said, he'll put the biographies in the chat as we go through. Please do put your questions in as we go through. Um, and I will disappear now and let Mary share her screen. Thanks so much, Ruth. Um, and hi, everyone. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining today. Um, let me just get everything shared. And Ruth, could you just give me a quick thumbs up if you can see that okay? check everything's all right there before I get started. An audio thumbs up. Yep, that's perfect. Audio thumbs up is perfect. Thanks so much. So um, yeah, everyone, welcome. Like we said, uh, my name's Mary Gagen. I'm a professor of geography here at Swansea, and this is kind of my day job. Um, what I work on are the records of how our climate has changed in the past that we can find in the annual rings of trees, because you're all big tree fans. You'll have looked inside a felled trunk or a fallen trunk and seen those uh, concentric circles that tell us so much about the past. But because I'm a geographer, you can't do geography and you can't work on trees um, without sooner or later um, ending up as an accidental climate scientist. Um, and what I particularly become interested in, because I do a lot of work around outreach and how we communicate um, climate change issues, is how useful, how incredibly important trees are for helping us to have conversations about the environment. So I'm gonna take a meander today through, I try to bring in as many different aspects of what I think are the important questions when we think about trees and climate today. Um, and there, there, there may be a few surprises, but I'm happy to, take, uh, happy to take questions at the end. So one of the things I've noticed over the last few years is if you pop trees um, and climate change into Google, you will be immediately inundated with a very simple answer to how we correct everything that's wrong with the planet at the moment, which is just plant a tree and you will immediately save the planet. Um, and, you know, obviously we, we know as climate scientists that there is a plethora of amazing things that trees do for us. And I'll talk in a minute about, about how it is that trees are our kind of top trump card with green infrastructure and particularly big trees and the right tree in the right place but this kind of narrative i found really interesting to observe and to the extent that actually i don't know if you noticed but the google doodle so the little kind of video gif that google put out for earth day was all about tree planting this year and i think one of the one of the problems and one of the reasons that that we as climate scientists have to kind of be wary of the narrative around tree planting 
is that it's super convenient if we don't actually want to make any changes. Um, there's lots of issues with offsetting skis and this sort of thing that if we, you know, if we keep planting trees, we can carry on driving our big SUVs. Um, and I sort of want to pick apart this narrative a bit and, and ask, why are we so obsessed with trees when we think about climate change? Because climate scientists think about trees from a slightly different perspective. Um, so we're just, just showing some beautiful pictures of trees here. Um, as soon as we see these, we immediately recognize the kind of what, what we often call the everyday miracle going on in this tree canopy of photosynthesis. The fact that trees, without us having to do anything, with a bit of watering for the start of their lives, convert CO2 to wood, leaves and roots. But actually on the climate side, what's important about trees is the picture on the right of these weird little green donuts. Um, I'm sure lots of you know, these are stomatal guard cells. So they're the little pores in the underside of deciduous leaves or in the groove on the base of a needle leaf tree that allow trees to exchange CO2 and water with the atmosphere. And these are the reason why trees are our secret climate weapon, because they interact with the two most important cycles on the planet, the carbon cycle and the water cycle. And when stom stomata were one of the most critical points of evolution in our, our planetary history, 400 million years ago, they developed and they allowed plants to come out of the water onto the land and not boil. They allowed them to control their water and gas exchange mechanisms and allowed plants to expand across the planet. And these little stomata are so important that actually plants and particularly trees have their own term in our climate models. So the big models that we use to figure out how our climate's changing now and how it's gonna change in the future Plants physiological forcing is an entire suite in our climate model systems because that interaction between trees and the carbon and water cycles is, is so important. And as a climate scientist, it's that critical ability to interact with both the major components of the climate system and the earth system, the two most important cycles, that means they, they are our secret weapon. It's what, it's what to me is behind why we have naturally come to think of them as step one in how we start to reach the goals that the IPCC have said that we need to reach to uh, avoid dangerous climate change. But as a geographer, we never think about a planet without thinking about people as well. And um, there are all of these other things that trees do that I'm sure you all know about. And I always think of these ecosystem service components as kind of a jigsaw. We can't leave any piece out um, because, because they're all important in thinking about how we can harness trees potential to support us uh, getting back to a stable position with nature and with our climate. They, would, they lay down carbon, obviously, but all those kind of climate regulation factors are important as well. And really what they do for us in terms of our well-being, everything that those of you who, who understand the urban forest, I'm sure a lot better than I do know, all these amazing things that actually crime rates go down, property prices go up. My favourite, students concentrate better in lessons if they can see trees outside their classroom window. My students get told that on a weekly basis. So it's impossible for us to separate the science from what they do for us as a society. And it's really, really important that we kind of focus on all these different elements. But there's another factor to how trees interact um, with us. And I think over the last few years, I've seen this response of let's just plant trees everywhere. Um, this is uh, me working in Namibia about 10 years ago. And there's an ecologist called William Bond who works on the idea of forest restoration around the globe, who talks about the danger of what he calls the rush to trees. So very often we might look at a landscape like this and think we're looking at a degraded landscape where there used to be woodland, there used to be forest, and now there isn't anymore. There's just a few remnant trees. But actually, we have lots of landscapes that are not the right place to plant trees across the globe. This land surface is a perfect example of how we would negatively impact the reflectivity, the albedo of the surface of the earth. If we were to convert this pale savanna to dark forest, we would trap more heat there. And I think it's really interesting to think globally, even when we think about our little trees in our parkland, because we need to maybe think about learning to value what's around us in different ways. One of the things I work in the tropics sometimes, one of the things that we've been looking at in the tropics for about the last five to 10 years is the value of what we would look at and consider to be really quite profoundly degraded forest. So secondary regrowth forest where 
the tropical rainforest has been cleared and kind of scrubby vegetation has grown back. And actually, it turns out that scrubby vegetation is still of really high conservation value in the tropics and really high carbon value as well. And things like that make me think, well, what about degraded forest here? The Woodland Trust's report on the state of forests and woodland in the UK has just revealed actually a hugely high percentage of forest here is profoundly degraded. But does that mean it's not still of high conservation value potentially and high carbon value? So I think we're at a time when we've got some really, really interesting questions to ask about what we already have when we think about how to interact with the idea of planting and how we get those two things to juxtapose to help us combat climate change. As a fantastic um, uh, author, Bonnie Waring, scientist who, who has drawn attention recently to the fact that we are never going to have enough trees or be able to plant enough trees to completely offset our carbon emissions. And we have to look at what we've got already in order to balance those two things together. So throughout this talk, I've just given a little few bits of references. If you want to read more, there's a kind of little read more on a couple of slides and I can share those in the chat afterwards if, um, if people want that information. So that's a little global perspective and I'm gonna hone in now on, um, on the more sort of urban idea of where we are losing trees and why I became really interested um, as a climate scientist in, in urban woodland and in trees outside of, um, outside of woodland. So, I live in Swansea in South Wales. What you're looking at here are two satellite images of how something called um, a normalised vegetation difference index, NDVI. You don't need to worry too much about the details. Essentially, it's a graphical way of showing difference in vegetation cover. If there's more healthy vegetation in a pixel, there's more chlorophyll and there's more reflected green light. So essentially, green is good. And when we look at these two images, we kind of see, okay, great, Swansea isn't doing too badly. But actually when we hone in on that city center as we were able to do from looking at these very high resolution satellite images, that critical development blob in the middle of Swansea, like a lot of, of cities have at the moment, is losing canopy cover and particularly losing mature trees in a really alarming way. So whilst you know, climate scientists and geographers were thinking globally in terms of how we restore forest and how we think about woodland creation schemes, I actually think we ignore the urban environment really at our peril because it is so important. Um, so I wanted to talk for the last couple of minutes about why I think there's actually something that we miss as climate scientists in thinking about what the most important thing that trees and particularly urban trees do in terms of action on climate. Um, I think that actually comes down to something that they help us overcome. So actually really what's holding us back in terms of converting science and talk on climate change to action is our complete inability to agree across political divides. Um, and trees, in my experience, urban trees really help us overcome that because they get in the middle of this a very annoying thing that our brain does called politically motivated reasoning where if we see an uncomfortable truth and it doesn't fit with who, our, who we are and what our values are as an individual, we just don't believe that truth. And really annoyingly, a brilliant researcher called Dan Kahan, who researches this stuff, has found out that the more scientifically informed we are, the stronger our politically motivated reasoning is because we feel we have evidence to back that up. And to me, I've had a lot of experience of where sticking a tree in the middle of a debate, debate between two people who sit wildly on different sides of a political fence in terms of their value systems, suddenly that goes away because everybody just wants to look after this tree. So that's kind of on the positive side, but I wanted to share the kind of more challenging experience as a geographer of um, thinking about what the right tree in the right place actually looks like. And I think it's pretty important that we remember that there is a geography to figuring this out. So I just wanted to share two quotes with you. The left um, comes from a conversation I had with some people who have st just started a really big woodland uh, restoration project in Wales, and they bought some land to take it out of agricultural production and do conversion uh, to woodland. And on the day they bought this farm, they were met with um, the mum of the farmer saying, you know, this land is too good for trees. Um, she was devastated at the idea of her land being removed from being sheep farming land to becoming woodland. 
Um, and that's a very real issue in, in Wales. The Climate Change Committee has recommended that agricultural production is essentially removed from upland Wales by 2050. And that's a massive change in our, in our culture and how we use that land, but it's really important. And on the right, I just wanted to end on sharing, um, sharing some of Swansea's experience there um, when we started a group called Save Swansea's Trees that were looking at um, felling in the city centre and how to overcome that. And then with the support of um, Joe Coles and his team, I think he's on, on the call somewhere, um, are actually developing an urban tree forum in Swansea and, and we're massively supported by Woodland Trust in achieving that. And had our little uh, mini Sheffield moment where suddenly uh, we were in a very contentious situation and, and our chair at the time was saying, you know what, I, I just wanted to plant some trees. Um, so I think I just wanted to bring to you um, how useful I think that geography can be when we think about getting this future planting jigsaw and retention jigsaw right. Um, there is a geography to getting, figuring out the right tree in the right place and what that looks like. Um, and, and I think if we can bring all those different human elements into asking what future treescapes should look like to best combat climate change, um, we'll we'll do we'll do a really good job and, and we will be able to harness this amazing green infrastructure potential that um, that trees have. Um, and I'm just going to stop right there. Thank you. My um, that was a bit of a whistle stop tour. I, I recognise, but my contact details are on there. If anyone has any any questions that we're not able to get to today, and I'll just stop sharing so we can go back to the chat there. Brilliant. Thank you, Mary. That was a uh, bang on time as well, which is always fantastic. <laughs> Extra brownie points. Um, some really interesting points there. I love the, the idea of the rush to trees um, mm -hmm. and some of the challenges that are coming through. Right, I think we'll, we'll pass straight on to Kristen, who's appeared nicely, thank you, um, to, from Swansea to London and some of the challenges uh, around adaptation and mitigation. Over to you. Thanks, Ruth. Um, and is that starting to work? Can you see it? It is, yes. If you put it on slideshow, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm just trying to, it's, ah, let's see. Sorry, it's just not, it doesn't seem to be like wanting to do that. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. Yeah, it's just, the thing isn't quite working. Let me see if I can find the other one. Sorry about that. I'm just going to see if I can find the um, the other version. No worries. It wouldn't be a uh, wouldn't be a webinar if we didn't have some kind of technical issue at some point. <laughs> just a reminder while you're never going to be that, it. Right. Do continue to put your um, your questions in the Q and A. Um, and that's that's brilliant. That's showing. That work? Great. Perfect. Sorry about that. So hi, yeah, I'm Kristen, um, and I run the London Climate Change Partnership. So I, with Ruth, I sit in the environment team at um, Greater London Authority. I sit in the climate change adaptation team, and I run the London Climate Change Partnership. So that's basically, I, I sit in City Hall, but my role is a lot more outward facing. It's really about trying to coordinate activity among different partners and stakeholders across London um, to consider how climate change is going to affect the city and how we can work together to try to manage some of the risks and the hazards and, and the impacts. Um, so yeah, so I was going to say a little bit about how we understand the risks um, from climate change in London and, you know, some of what we're doing about that and kind of try to work in how trees fit into this picture. And I think it follows on nicely from some of the things that Mary was talking about before. So first of all, why do we need to adapt? I mean, we need to adapt because we're basically, we're just not very well prepared for the weather that we're already having, despite, you know, let alone the climate change that we're expecting into the future. Um, and we know that in the future, based on climate projections, that, you know, the climate in the future is going to present some serious challenges to our current ability to cope um, with change. And so we've already seen, you know, plenty of what we call extreme weather, like you can see here. Um, and I think the frequency with which we're seeing weather that we call extreme is, you know, it potentially shows that it's not really that extreme after all, and it's really a new normal that we're looking at and something that we need to think about and, and think about how to manage better. And some of the, um, the interventions that we'll have to put in place might take years or decades or more to be, to, <clears throat> to be ready. 
So in terms of how we understand climate change in London, I mean, basically, our, you know, we have our three kind of major risk areas. One is flooding, one is heat, and one is water scarcity or drought. And so we have information on, for example, the surface water risk to properties in London. So surface water is a huge risk for us in London because um, you know, it doesn't happen in a big single event like a big river flood or a tidal flood, but it does create an awful lot of damage that's kind of dispersed. And so it's something that we really need to be mindful of and thinking about. In terms of heat, um, we've also got heat and, and that's intensified by the urban heat island effect, which can actually make the center of our city up to 10 degrees hotter than the sort of surrounding rural areas. And we already see the impacts on services and on people and on people's health and so forth. And we see that happening even when we're not having a heat wave, you know, even in a kind of what we would call a normal sort of a summer. And so that's something we need to be thinking about, but also, you know, the impacts of that are not equal or fair. And I'll say a little bit more about that in just a minute. Finally, it's drought or water scarcity. And I think, you know, given the kind of weather that we've been having recently here in London, I think, um, you know, it's a little bit surprising to many people that we are in one of the most water stressed areas in not just the, the country, but in the world. Um, and this, um, illustration just is from Thames Water that just shows the the projected deficit, the supply demand deficit in water in megaliters per day, about 400 megaliters of water per day um, by around the middle of the century if we don't actually find some new water resources. So in terms of um, the impacts of climate change on people being not equal or fair, I just think it's worth noting this because um, you know, it's easy to start to think about climate change as, you know, the stuff that falls from the sky or the temperature outside, but actually a lot of it has to do with uh, the ability of people to cope with the potential impacts. Um, and climate change will have, you know, will cause, uh, will exacerbate some of those issues. So, you know, um, income deprivation and poverty will make it more difficult for people to move, for example. Um, people who are socially isolated or lonely will, um, potentially have more trouble surviving in heat waves as we've seen in other parts of the world. People in you know poorly um, poorly built or poorly designed housing will also have you know more problems with heat and things like that. And so it's just something that we need to think about in you know in terms of what the risks are in terms of climate change, but also in the responses. So in terms of what we're doing, I mean there is sort of national climate change adaptation policy that was part of the Climate Change Act. Um, that you know, goes in five year cycles where nationally the UK has to produce a climate change risk assessment every five years followed by a national um, adaptation program. And the next, we're in the third cycle of that and the next climate change, UK climate change risk assessment comes out next month. So we'll keep an eye out for that and we'll be sending stuff around about that. But here in London, we also have policy to try to you know, do adaptation. And, you know, it wouldn't be surprising that in our environment strategy, there's a whole chapter on the policies and programs that we are, we have put in place to try to adapt London to its changing climate. But we know that adaptation is not just about the environment, it's about um, all of the systems and functions of the city that need to be ready for the changing climate. And so, of course, we have um, adaptation and the consideration of climate risks embedded across different mayoral strategies like our the London plan, our spatial strategy, transport strategy, and the resilience strategy, and others as well like food and housing and things like that. So strategy is not really going to get us, you know, completely there. And I think um, you know, we also, and the mayor also has, you know, quite limited powers in terms of adaptation to climate change. And so my partnership, for example, can provide the type of support, to, you know, um, decision support tools and, and resources that people might need to help uh, in terms of adapting their own communities, their businesses, their, you know, sectors and so forth. And what we do in terms of our activities, things like commissioning research into the, the impacts of climate change on you know, for example, the, tra the transport sector or the health sector or other areas. Um, we do actual projects, like we've done retrofitting projects to try to retrofit homes for changing climate, producing guidance and advice, like the types of um, documents you see there. And a lot of our work is based on just knowledge exchange that's getting people into rooms together to, or into Zoom calls together to, um, to share their learning, to share their problems and their solutions, and hopefully 
try to, um, you know, try to work things out and, and work out how to adapt in more resilient ways. And so we're really here, I think, to like to celebrate trees, obviously. So I think, you know, Mary mentioned that, you know, trees have a really important role in how we, we think about how to adapt to climate change, um, both in terms of their role as green infrastructure and, you know, just in and, in and of themselves. I'll explain what I mean about that. I mean, you know, I think we've heard before that, you know, trees have cooling benefits, you know, the shade actually helps to cool our cities um, and, you know, um, their air quality benefits. Um, there are water attenuation benefits. Um, trees can actually provide it, you know, stability for embankments so that, you know, you don't have landslides. Um, there, you know, there are air quality benefits, but also there can be potential risks in terms of air quality, depending on how green infrastructure is designed. Um, and we've tried to incorporate, you know, in London and in the Greater London Authority, we've tried to incorporate trees and, you know, um, and green cover into some of our decision support tools for different sectors. And so this um, project called Cool Spaces, you can find it on the GLA's website, but effectively it was a project that was launched last year to try to create and map um, spaces in London that are particularly cool um, using uh, some land surface temperature data and just information about some of the you know, tree canopy cover and what have you. And it's basically just for people who are out and about who might just you know, want some respite from the heat. We've also got, some of you may have seen, we have a green infrastructure focus map, and that's looking at different socioeconomic kind of indicators, but also looking at, you know, the potential for green infrastructure to be used in particular ways in different spaces across the city. So what is the best kind of green infrastructure to be using for a particular issue in a, in a particular place? We've got um, a London tree canopy cover map, which many of you are probably familiar with, and I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, and we've also done a little bit of work just mapping um, inequality and climate change. So just looking at, um, you know, heat and flood risk overlay with uh, indicators of social vulnerability. And there's some work on green, there's some um, data on green space in this as well. And so it's really just about trying to you know, provide the kinds of tools and support to support better decision making. But we also know that there are going to be plenty of risks to the trees themselves. And I think that's important because of, you know, if we are considering trees and green infrastructure to be a solution, like Mary said, everybody says just plant trees everywhere. I mean, if, if greenery is going to be the solution to everything, then we need to be really careful about, you know, how well that greenery is going to be able to survive itself in a changing climate. And we do know that there are risks to trees from climate change, um, from things like pests and diseases, from, you know, the, the point that we may have, you know, a lot less water than we used to. Um, wildfires are also a risk. And so those are things that we, um, we also need to be considering. Um, so those are kind of a few, I think, of the, the sort of the ways that we think about trees and, and green spaces fitting into our city in, in terms of adap adapting to climate change. Um, and it's just kind of a very whistle stop tour, but um, I will leave it there. And I think that's, those are my contact details. So thanks very much. Fantastic. Thanks, Kristen. Um, yeah, there's, there's so much depth here that it would be nice to go into in more detail, but we're, we're being very good and staying within the time. Um, lots of interesting resources there to, to look at. I'm going to move on now to Professor Matt Disney from UCL, who tantalizingly has the title um, Urban Forests in 3D. Uh, so I'll leave you to, to share your screen, Matt, and, and please do continue to ask questions in the Q&A. There's some great ones coming through. Thank you. So can you um, see my, my screen there? Perfect. Okay, great. Well, thanks everybody for coming along and thanks for inviting me. And also thank you, thanks to uh, Mary and Kristen for providing um, really that interesting overview of things and um, perspectives that I'll, I'll echo and I'll come back to um, in particular a couple of comments that Mary made about um, big, the importance of big trees and the right trees in the right place and um, that question, oh, I just wanted to plant some trees, you know, it's, there's no such thing as just planting trees. So what I'm going to, um, to talk about is, is my interest is, has been um, in trying to understand uh, trees in the kind of bigger picture of, of climate and the carbon cycle using things like satellites and aircraft and new ground-based observations that help us um, build 
pictures of, of trees and capture them in, in three dimensions in ways that um, we haven't been able to do um, before now that tells us a lot about um, you know, what it is that makes trees, what limits their, um, you know, their physiology, the size, um, their ability to respond to climate change and so on. And some of those measurements are really kind of um, you know, showing us new things or allowing us to explore trees in new ways. And I'll show that um, in terms of the perspective of, of urban forests as well. So I focused mainly on non-urban forests in the past in areas like the tropics and in temperate forests. And one of the things that led me here is obviously um, I'm interested in trees more generally. And one, we were wondering whether some of the methods that we applied in, in kind of tropical forests and in faraway places could be applied much closer to home. And the answer is yes. And I'll, I'll come back to these two rather lovely oak trees on, on Hampstead Heath in a minute. So urban forests are you know, a key, key um, thing for all of us who live in cities. And of course, more and more of us do by 2030, that'll be 60% of the world's population. Um, so urban forests take on many different forms. Um, you know, there's, there's trees in, in all sorts of different places. And this is um, us working in, in Highgate Cemetery. And what's, what's been interesting to us is uh, how if you leave trees or you let them grow large and you protect them from the sort of vicissitudes of urban change in some respects, they can provide the kind of values that we want that we heard um, both Mary and Christian talking about in terms of their capacity to shade, their capacity to mitigate runoff, uh, and just their general aesthetic properties. Um, much better if we if we protect and manage those larger trees. It takes trees are very slow growing. That's one of the um, you know the, the key characteristics of a tree as an organism. It's very slow growing. It takes them a long time to get large. Um, and so one of the, the, the key questions is, well, what are the benefits and trade-offs of planting new trees versus maintaining existing um, woodland and trees? And what we see is that, that you know, actually it, it takes a lot to replicate um, what you get from a large tree. You lose one large tree and, and, you know, we all know the numbers game is not the game to play. We can plant lots of small trees but many of them won't survive uh, and if they do they won't provide the benefits that we want for many years to come. So urban forests are very important, but they have particular pressures um, and values that, that are different from their kind of natural grown counterparts. And that's one of the, the problems I found coming to this sort of idea of studying urban forests in comparison to natural grown forests is often a lot of what we apply to urban trees is what's been learned from non-urban trees. And of course the pressures are very, very different. Um, we shouldn't look at urban trees as just, you know, kind of misplaced wild trees. Um, and so that, that example I showed at the beginning of those two trees on Hampstead Heath, this is, a, you know, this is a kind of extreme example of these pressures that urban trees face. Those are the same two trees on the left hand side there um, about 100, 130 years ago when the area was um, essentially scraped clean for chalk um, uh, mining and the local landowner basically decided to get rid of everything there and sell it off and then was prevented from doing so. And there was a whole lot of politics involved in the, in the preservation of those trees. There they are now in the middle and behind me as well in my, in my backdrop here, um, you know, a hundred and some, something years later. I don't know why those two trees were saved particularly. They were already quite mature at that point and now they're over 200 years old and they look surrounded by bucolic woodland, but of course that was all planted. So. One of the kind of big questions that that we need to think about is is when we're government making policy and we're making decisions about um, you know trees are a good thing urban trees are a good thing we can all agree on that but the kind of metrics we use to um, quantify and to um, you know to generate funding and to think about these in a political sense are quite crude at the moment so things like canopy cover is a very important metric. Um, and it's a very straightforward one to calculate and to communicate, but it doesn't capture really the value of the trees because it's effectively a two dimensional picture 
but trees are three-dimensional. So if you are negating to, to take into account the height of the trees, then, then we have a, a, a problem because the height and the size of the trees is one of their key properties. Um, so that's what I've been doing over the last few years is, is going around various areas of urban forests and using a combination of ground-based measurements and airborne and satellite, new satellite observations that can capture forests in three dimensions. So this is the um, Olympic Park. Um, which is some work that we've been doing there, characterizing uh, bat habitats uh, with the newly plant planted trees at Queen Elizabeth Park. Um, this, th there's, a, there's a wide range of new data sources that have come online over the last five, 10 years. They've been around for longer than that, but they haven't been free to access. So this is a map of kind of where I live in, in Hackney. Uh, and if we look up on the top left, we've got Finsbury Park. And then in the center there, you'll see the very dense tree cover of Abney Cemetery, one of London's seven um, great cemeteries. Each of those individual colored dots is a tree that's been picked out by this uh, technique called LIDAR, which is uh, uh, an aircraft flying with um, a, a rapidly pulsing laser beam underneath it, which is, enables you to measure the height of the trees, not just how many trees there are, not just where they are, but how tall they are uh, and how big their, their crowns are. And this, this kind of data is now available um, freely from the Environment Agency and other government agencies that is allowing us to map the sort of three-dimensional structure of urban forests in a different way. Um, one of the things, the first things we did with this was say, well, look, um, carbon storage and the amount of carbon stored in trees is a key property for things like tropical forests. How much carbon is locked up in tropical forests? Uh, and we decided to try and look at how much carbon was stored in areas of London. And so this was this graph shows um, that one of the surprising things, and again, I come back to this point, if you let trees grow large and you leave them to reach their kind of full size potential, you can see here on the right hand side that the maximum carbon per unit area stored in, in pockets of forest in Camden is almost as high as it is for tropical rainforest. So there's, there's, there's pieces of forest in Camden that have as much carbon per unit area as almost as much as a tropical rainforest, but they're very small, of course. So they're, they're not very large in terms of the total amount of carbon, but it just shows that if you allow trees to grow large and mature, they have an extraordinary capacity to do the kind of things that they do in tropical forest as well. Um, other things that the, this kind of um, new measurement allows us to do is to make um, assessments of the kind of forest structure, not just in the public domain, but also in private domain. You know, half the trees in London or more are in private spaces. And so, of course, um, if we only consider the ones that the, the, the kind of public facing infrastructure can deal with, we miss half the trees. And so this kind of top down view allows us to look in both public and private spaces. And we can see the, um, the structural nature of the forest and the connectivity between streets and pockets of greenery. And of course that connectivity is in many ways almost as important as the amount of tree stuff there is in the first place. So providing these corridors is crucial for things like biodiversity of birds and mammals and pollinators. And so again, this is a way that allows us to capture that benefit that isn't captured in a, a straightforward map of canopy cover or just considering how many trees we have. So I kind of come back to this point that we, we need to do better in thinking about the, the uh, and making this, the, the reinforcing the point that Kristen made about the information that we use to make decisions. Obviously, we all know the decisions we make now about urban forests, we're going to be living with for um, 50 years or more. Um, and so this three dimensional aspects of, of forests and urban forests, particularly, I think is now is, is really crucial that we take into account. Um, it allows us to capture the value of uh, trees and uh, in an urban context much more effectively than just a kind of two dimensional approach. So we really, really need to bring this into to thinking about how we value things. The, the real risk is if we focus on, on canopy cover only, which I think there's a real risk of doing so because it is easy to do and it's easy to communicate. And so politicians just see that first line, let's increase canopy cover you can replace a single large tree with five small ones and end up with the same canopy cover, but almost zero value in terms of the kind of ecosystem and other services. So we need to make better um, uh, information available for decision-making. So I'll finish on that note and there are my contact details there as well. Thank you very much for inviting me.
Brilliant. Thank you, Matt. Um, and you've also finished on the perfect note for some of the questions that are coming in. So that's uh, that's very well done indeed. If I could ask everyone to turn their videos back on, then we can pick up some of the questions that have come through the Q&A. So I think, I mean, there's a, a theme around value. Um, and as Neil has pointed out, there is a more in-depth session around value as one of these webinars coming up on Saturday. But I think we should we should touch on, on this. And um, John and Mark and Alejandra all, have all asked basically around the same question, which is, um, with a climate change lens, how do you think we should balance resources uh, as a society between protect, tree protection and tree planting? And what's coming through as well is around how you make the sort of value case. I think it's it's been touched on by all three of you in your presentations. Um, perhaps, Mary, do you want to, to start off with that one? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's the question that keeps us all awake at night, isn't it? And I, I, uh, there's, I'm a big fan of the IPCC, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I know it we, it receives a lot of criticism, but it is actually a brilliant structure for dealing with something as complicated as climate change. And after sweating for, you know, the IPCC has been working for, for more than a, a decade now, um, after kind of sweating over the way to wrap this stuff up, their phrase of how, what we need to do is we need changes in every sector of society at a scale not seen before, rapidly, you know, it's it's speed, it's every sector to a level we haven't done before. And I, every time I'm kind of asked this about decision making, I kind of come back to that because I think you can apply it to pretty much every environmental battle we've got right now. We just, we can't look away from any direction. We really do just need it to be every everything. We have to look at retention and we have to look at planting and we have to get both of them right. Um, and I think one thing I would say is it's a very exciting time in this field. I mean, that the, the work that Matt just showed, the idea of using LIDAR over a city, you know, even within the time I've been studying, LIDAR was a 10,000 pounds an hour thing involving a giant plane and that you couldn't tilt because the LIDAR would stop working. And, and now it's incredibly accessible. There's a huge amount of data to make much smarter decisions than before. Um, and I really, to, to me on trees, it's got to be uh, retention as standard and get planting right. And, and there's not really, there's not really any possibility to say, which one of those do we do more? We have to come back to that IPCC phrase of, of every sector. We, we really do. And I think that's, I think that's why uh, climate is in such a kind of stuck position in terms of communicating right now, because we're still looking for the easy path. We're still looking for, oh, you know, you want me to consume less? Can I just plant a tree? Um, we've got to, we've got to stop that. We've, we've got to kind of stop the easy decisions and, and our, our social primate brain doesn't like to do that. It likes to find the path of least resistance. Um, so, so I think just, just not letting ourselves do that on any level is, is the important, is the important way forward. Mm, absolutely. That's the case in so many areas of climate change discussion, isn't it? Matt, you've put your hand up. Yes. Thank, I just wanted to add to what uh, Mary was saying there that the, um, I totally agree. And I think one of the issues is this, um, there's always um, a, 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 there's, a, there's a, a sort of an attempt to provide an easy narrative, uh, to, you know, because it, it is easy. And when you're asked to provide information that might be relevant to policymakers, wrap it up simple, keep it, keep it simple, keep the message high level. And I think while I appreciate, you know, why that is, sometimes that, that ends up meaning that we use you know, information or people latch on to things, uh, perhaps unexpectedly, the kind of, you know, there's, there's all sorts of examples of this, 1.5 degrees of warming or um, planting trees or, uh, you know, and I, I use this example when I mention things like canopy cover. I think canopy cover is, is a really important metric, but it's not the only metric. And if, if it becomes the one that gets embedded in everything, then it has all these unintended consequences. And so many of the, of the um, you know, focusing on one aspect, because it's easy to, to sell, it's easy to buy, uh, and then suddenly you're locked in to a decision that is going to be very hard to unpick. And that, that comes back to things like maintaining trees. It's just, you know, what, what this is Mary's point. Those big trees have huge amounts of value and planting trees is really important. But th the key thing that I've seen with um, urban planting, it's not so much that the, the, the will isn't there or, you know, sometimes the space may not be there. If you go to Islington, there's very little 
public space where you can plant trees for starters, but it's the survival rate. It's what happens once you replace one large tree with 20 small ones, it's very easy for someone to come along three years later and go, okay, the priorities of this road have changed, the priorities of this have changed. Well, they're only three years old. It doesn't matter. We can get rid of those and we'll replant. We'll plant 30 more. And then the same decision keeps happening and you end up always with young trees that never get allowed to grow old. And that's, that's the issue is who's going to look after them and what's the protection going to be when you plant those trees in 10, 20 years time? Mm. No, absolutely. And I, I think we can see uh, the sort of passion that people have for, for individual trees in their local area coming through quite strongly in the Q&A at the moment. I mean, uh, Kristen, I hate to do this to you, but but there are, <laughs> within the GLA, there were a lot of discussions uh, across our team around the pressures on urban trees, aren't there, in terms of very specific examples like the happy man tree that come up quite mm -hmm. often. And uh, I mean, do you want to say a little bit about um, some of those situations and, and how we balance, balance those challenges? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. And we see that a lot. And, and what Matt was talking about, too, you know, people just kind of saying, well, we'll just stick a tree in there, you know, and sort of end, but it ends up being kind of decoration more than anything else. And then, you know, you see there are areas of the city, uh, you know, in the center of London, where you've got these just these poor, sad little looking trees that aren't really doing anybody any good and probably aren't very healthy themselves. But it is that kind of rush, I think, like everyone else is saying, you know, that rush to kind of say, well, if we just put a tree there, that'll just sort it all out. And I think, you know, I guess part of what we try to do in terms of the partnership and in terms of, in terms of adaptation, I mean, one of the things I like about trying to do adaptation with people and do partnership working is it, it does try to like think a lot more clearly about how we're making decisions now that, are, that are, we're going to have to live with for a long time. And that means, you know, trying to make sure that the decisions we're making now aren't causing problems into the future and that we're actually bringing, you know, the right kinds of expertise and the right kinds of knowledge into those, those conversations. And so that's, you know, that's how we're hoping, you know, we can try to overcome some of those amazingly simplistic kind of, I, you know, um, conceptions of the problems and the solutions. Right. Yeah. I know. I mean, I, Ruth, I, could I just come back in on that if possible? Yeah, of course. Is that okay? I just, um, thanks so much, Kristen. I think that's so important. And I just, I'm always struck by when we think about, you know, this, this big, mature, beautiful tree, like the happy man tree being a perfect example versus our lollipop cherry tree that, you know, we, we, we very often kind of go, okay, fine. That tree's like Matt just said, dying, it can come out. And Actually, why do we care so differently about those trees? Because one of them has been in our lives and our mum and dad's lives and sometimes our grandparents' lives. That human connection that we have is why it is, you know, like a member of our family. And I think sometimes, and I've been guilty of this myself as a scientist, we, we overlook the importance in messaging when there are contentious issues of that emotional connection. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, we say this tree has half a ton of carbon in it. Okay actually it still makes it a look it i don't i don't want to kind of point fingers at development or anything like that and i don't think that's particularly useful to kind of have a them and us attitude but it makes it easier for people who are trying to make difficult decisions to come back and say it's just a few trees if we say actually you're emotionally damaging thousands of people that suddenly becomes a loss that is much more real and actually i i found myself thinking the science isn't actually the way to make this argument it's actually the, the emotive argument we almost need to stop shying away from. It feels sometimes like the, car the carbon and the wildlife stuff. And those, I'm not, I'm not saying they're not important arguments, but I think sometimes we're embarrassed to say, actually the impact of this is because I walked past that with my granddad. <laughs> you know, we, we, kind of, we kind of need to stop shying away from that value element, I think. That's, that's a really interesting point. Matt, you look like you're going to come in on that one as well. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, I think that that's, you know, the, 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 the challenge there is that um, you're right, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're often uncomfortable, particularly as scientists, as a physical, you know, as a hard physical scientist, that's not um, something that is, is easy to do. But the, 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 those values are arguably, or perhaps not even arguably, are the most important values in urban trees, are the aesthetic, the cultural, the historical. And again, I, you know, the, the way 
but a local council will say, I have a bottom line, I have a budget, I have to do this, you know, essentially I have to make a decision. It's this tree or it's those trees, what do I do? Uh, and so we then provide tools and things to, uh, to try and somehow quantify those things. And my, my feeling from looking at this from the kind of more sort of physical science perspective is there's a real, um, there's a real effort to try and uh, be conservative because we're say we're, we're happier um, taking that conservative valuation. Because if we just consider the carbon and the other sort of you know ecosystem services that we can value, we can be sure of saying the tree is worth at least this much, right. right? It's not worth less than that. It's worth at least this much. So here's the bottom value of that tree. What we're not comfortable with is saying what's the possible maximum value? Because if you then try and incorporate those other cultural and aesthetic things, this this upper value goes high to some rather unspecified level but but that's the envelope that you should be looking at and saying actually it's somewhere in here we don't maybe know where it is but it is somewhere in here but we're much more comfortable taking this bottom value because we're comfortable saying i know that the tree is worth at least this much yeah. definitely more not less and i'm happy to state that not it could be anywhere in here and it's up to you and societies more generally to decide where we think that is because that's going to control the budget then yeah, I'm actually going to pick you up on that one, Matt, because I think there's a question here from John around the, the sort of metrics we should be using to communicate, uh, particularly communicate progress or lack of progress in urban forestry. And I think that's that's come up a lot in natural capital accounting, hasn't it? Almost overvaluation and then trying to make that reality on the ground. I mean, what do you think around that? I, you know, I think that you, if you don't try and take those things into account somehow, as, as, as Mary pointed out, then you, you, it, it is, it's very easy to make the case one way or another, oh, I'm doing well because I've got you know, this canopy cover and I've got this many trees and I'm storing this amount of carbon and the temperature is regulated by this amount. Okay, good job, well done. Um, that doesn't say anything about the, the, the aesthetic and, you know, people are doing work in that area, quantitative work, looking at the health benefits and the, you know, the, the, the more difficult to quantify, people are looking at that. And so I think we're probably going to see over the next five or 10 years, a real explosion in that area, the whole, you know, lockdown problems and people accessing parks and green space has really brought that to the front page. Okay, everybody needs to get out and find some some space and green space to have access to that. So, the issues of inequality of access and the type, what we consider to be green space and so on suddenly are a, a lot higher up the agenda than they were a year ago or eighteen months ago, which is can only be a good thing because I think there's a there's there's probably more of an open door in saying actually. Let's think about those values and how we somehow quantify the wrong word, but we bring those into the argument because they, they are really important. Mm, absolutely. Is it, does anyone else want to sort of pick up on, on that question? Or should we, should we move on? Because I mean, that's also come up in the questions around this is a new biodiversity metric calculator, mm -hmm. the value of street trees in particular. Um, and you make the point, Matt, around um, urban green space and, and reaching people who are currently underserved by, mm -hmm. by public open space is a real challenge. And street trees are often brought in as a, as a way of bringing that greening to where people are. But, but that obviously also has challenges. Um, I, think, I think one thing, and, and Kristen mentioned some of the inequalities issues, and that is something that I really hope, I really hope everybody involved in looking after parks and, and green spaces and particularly public green spaces starts to think about. When we look at um, the inequality around green space deprivation in the UK, um, it, is, it is, you know, profoundly important cultural issue. So I think the figures are something like 40% of diverse individuals in the UK are in green space deprived areas versus 14% of white people. And, and those those social inequalities have just been profoundly exacerbated by the pandemic. And, you know, we, li we live in a country where the amount of green space that's in private ownership is way above anything that's in nature reserves and, and public, public areas. And I think just that post pandemic reset that hopefully we're going to have starting to look at social prescribing, you know, for the, for the first time in my lifetime, GPs and, and our local NHS trust are looking at how we can prescribe people to spend time in green spaces and, and and like Matt said we are starting to be able to quantify the impact and understand the physiology of the impact on on 
on the ways in which it is important for our well-being and actually for our immune system um, to be around these areas. I'm, I'm hoping to see an explosion of understanding in the amount of time we spend around trees, um, but I'm not not holding my breath. <laughs> The fair amount of forest bathing and I think the very popular sessions during this week actually on forest bathing it's yeah it's fascinating to see the rise of that um coming through I think just picking up on a very specific question here from from Caroline uh, and, and sort of moving us away slightly towards the carbon capture side um Matt is there something you could say about how seasonal changes in deciduous trees affect the carbon capture uh, yeah, it's. Um, I mean, it, it doesn't affect it a huge amount in as much as the the, the leaves are a very small, re you know, a relatively small part of the overall carbon of, of a of a mature well, of a tree at all. Um, that's because it can afford to lose them. It's evolved in in, in that process. So, um, you know, the majority of the stored carbon is, uh, you know, all the stored carbon is in the woody material and the roots and so on. And some of it ends up in the soil as well. But the um, so the leaves are actually a very small part of it, and they they obviously come and go every year. So we tend to think of that as uh, from a, you know the kind of um, trees carbon perspective as, as essentially negligible. Uh, obviously, that's not quite true in the overall system because if the, the leaves then fall in, an, in, an, in a natural piece of woodland, those leaves then go into the soil and there is there is turnover of nutrients and so on. So that's a, that is a key part of the system. In an urban context, that again is one of the differences is that that material is carried away. So if the trees are leaving nutrients in the leaves, which they they try and avoid. Um, but some inevitably gets gets left and gets recycled in the soil. In urban areas, that do, that doesn't happen, and so that the, the nutrient balance is is different again. Um, but in terms of the overall carbon, it's it's not a you know if you if you take a large tree that that might weigh ten or fifteen tons, you've got you know uh, the leaves the dry weight of the leaves would be a few hundred kilos, and you know a lot of that wouldn't be carbon. That's really helpful. Thank you. I think, I mean, that brings us back in a way, I guess, to some of the discussion we were having about communication around some of the, the importance of trees, but also bringing some of the science in, into conversation in a way that's, that's helpful for that value conversation, for upskilling people, for, for making people understand. I mean, someone was raising a point around local authority um uh employees as well around how they they value trees and there's a point earlier in the conversation especially when mary you mentioned degraded um saying that's a, a normative word and we need to be really careful about qualifying our interpretation of evidence particularly when it's related to environmental quality i mean it's uh we're, we're getting towards sort of three minutes towards the end of the session but i think it might be quite a nice one to just reflect on uh each in turn reflect on what we can do to to help link the, the science and the sort of personal passion for trees in a way that, that helps the climate change agenda and where we want to go. Is anyone willing to take up that challenge? Kristen, you've, you've unmuted, that's a good sign. <laughs> no. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it kind of goes back to that conversation about how we talk with different kinds of communities and the kind of inequalities among different communities. I think, you know, one thing, that you know in terms of the relation i think what we have to do is stop making assumptions about the you know what other people think about the relationships between themselves and their natural environment the way they actually conceive of the natural environment at all and you know i think we have you know we do kind of make a lot of assumptions and maybe we're not really listening enough although i think like mary said before you know there's more and more research coming out about how you know the the um, the way we need more, you know, green space, we need to improve access to green space, but also in terms of how, you know, to now green space has often been designed with particular people and particular cultures in mind, and not really necessarily seen as welcome to some people who may not be of those cultures. So it's just, it's really, I think, just a matter of us going out and engaging a bit more with communities um, that we think need to be, you know, benefited by this, but not doing so much talking but maybe some more listening yeah i think that's a, that's a really fantastic fantastic take home actually a lot a lot more listening and yeah i think i think that's a really interesting point i mean I, i'm i was using the term as degraded forest as a science shorthand and actually i i absolutely would love to see i have this kind of dream of finding the worst in inverted commas patch of woodland in the uk and actually 
doing like a 10 year study, starting by quantifying what's in it. And we will be blown away by the amount of biodiversity, carbon and, and ecosystem services that are in it. You know, some scrubby thing with rhododendron and brambles everywhere. And, um, and actually looking at what restoration of that patch of woodland would look like. And, and I think just challenging those assumptions that we make because they help you know, let's face it, they help development when we when we value an area of land as low quality. Um, it's it's disastrous. And we're, we're, we're beyond the point where we can do that. Literally every patch of greenery, every bit of carbon, every bit of biodiversity is essential right now. Um, but yeah, the other points I wanted to make is just, you know, from from a geographical perspective, I think one of the things that concerns me about how far we have to go um, to start valuing our, our green spaces in our cities and elsewhere differently is how badly we kind of get stuck in our echo chambers. Um, you know, it's really easy to talk to people who agree with us. What we need to be able to do is have a conversation. I need to be able to have a conversation with somebody who has a totally different value system from me and thinks that my green politics threatens her ability to pass wealth onto her children you know that is a valid concern and a fear and and we can't stop we can't we can't just kind of have this political divide getting worse and worse because it, it is it is genuinely the barrier to, to getting somewhere so um yeah those projects i, I want to see people taking climate deniers forest bathing and seeing what happens to their views on the green environment we just we really need if ever there was a time to kind of have a radical approach to communication it's it's now that's brilliant yeah i think that leaves you matt with the last the last minute to, to, to top maybe to, to to um to take um issue with that no well, not issue but it kind of marries but you you know you take someone who is maybe skeptical about that thing that they're quite willing to go forest bathing go yeah i like I like forests, but I still don't believe in the idea of man-made climate change. Those two positions are entirely, you know, cognizant for many, many of us, many people. And so we, we have to recognize that as well. But um, so the going back to the listening, absolutely. Um, but also doing the best we can in terms of, of rethinking how we go about this whole business of valuation. What do, what do we mean by value and so on? And, you know, we can feed into that from a kind of, you know, we can provide inputs to that. We certainly can. Uh, we can provide the best science that we can do um, as part of that debate. Brilliant. And that's a fantastic uh, note to end on in that case. And, and just leaves me to thank you all for your time today and for joining us and to our speakers as well, to Mary, Matt and Kristen. Thank you thank for the you invite. Very much. Thanks for the invite. Thanks. thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ruth. Thanks for to, to the attendees for coming for your fantastic questions. Uh, and I think this discussion has set up the last three Tree Rings webinars very well. Um, we have one on ancient trees tomorrow lunchtime with uh, David Humphreys from Hampstead Heath, Peter Coles, um, our expert on mulberry trees in London, and Greg Packman. Uh, and then we have a session specifically on how we should value trees on Saturday, uh, chaired by Peter Fines, one of the um, steering group members of the Urban Tree Festival, with some fantastic speakers. And finally, a session on Sunday from three to four on campaigning for trees with specific reference to the Happy Man Tree and some of the people involved in that campaign. So please join us if you're not already signed up. Thanks for coming. And yeah, thanks to, again to the speakers for a great session. Thanks Ruth for chairing too. Thank you. Bye.